Ladies and Can gentlemen, thank you very much for your patience. I would like to let you know that since the government isn't giving us full disclosure, we might as well give you full disclosure. The information is overwhelming. The amount of evidence is absolutely incredible. We're going to share with you petroglyphs from New Mexico that will see six fingers. You're going to see what looks like extraterrestrials. You're going to see what looks like UFOs, flying objects. And this is in multiple states. And there's also an enormous amount of evidence of major cataclysmic events that seem to take place every X amount of years in cycles. And these things seem to show themselves around certain cycles of apocalyptic proportions. So buckle up for this, ladies and gentlemen. And also, I'd like to let you know about some specials right now for Leak Project listeners. Did you know that you have the right to keep your information to yourself? Oh, yeah. You should check out virtualshield.com slash leak project, the, the best virtual private network on the planet. And it's less than four bucks a month with the Leak Project discount. So check it out, virtualshield.com slash leak project. All right, now let's get back to the excitement. I've got the legendary legend of legends, Diamond from Oppenheimer Ranch and DJ Freedomus Films 420. Check him out on YouTube. It's great to have you both on the program. Some of these petroglyphs, folks, you're not going to find at a national park because it's on private land. And some of the best petroglyphs in the world are on private land. We're going to share it with you now. Hey, guys, how the heck are you? Diamond, Ransom. What's up? Doing good. What's up? All right. So <laughs> now it's starting to turn into an art museum here in the studio. So, folks, will you just look at it? Will you just look at it? It's all over the place. All right. So now let's look at the petroglyphs, though. We're going to get into the fun stuff. I'm waiting Diamond. for the open house. It's going to be an event. Oh, big, big event. Big event. So this stuff is also, it could be 800,000 years old, which means, did they come visit us a thousand years ago? Were they like, you know, were they, were they dropping mantis beans and ant people? Be like, and they're in their gear and they're walking up to us and they're like, hey, how you doing? We come from up there. Do you want to go over here and build a house? Because there's going to be a big lightning strike in a couple hours and you need to be in that cave. Diamond, what do you think? Ooh, well, I think that uh, I have evidence that after we look at some of these pictures, what I'm going to uh, show you, I have some graphics to share uh, about the plasma discharge experiments that were conducted in Los Alamos by Anthony Peratt and others and the associated glyphs that people were probably witnessing in our ancient skies in very recent times. We're talking unimaginable glowing things up near the North Pole that as the sun set, people were in awe and we'll show you those experiments, the experimental data and the petroglyphs that we believe prove that not only are our skies about to light up during this next cycle, but the ancients were warning us of these events that are coming. That's, that's fascinating. And as many people have brought up, both of you as well, it's as if a story was put in place in stone and then there have been people since then that have tried to cover it up and put their symbols over it to offset it. But let's get into this. Let's take a look at this first picture, Diamond, because this is one of my favorites. And this is in uh, the canyon that's just outside of Albuquerque. I'm going to go ahead and let you show this. You're going to show this, right, Diamond? Yeah, the screen share. The, the one with the, the robot. Or not the robot, but the ship. The one that you just showed me before we got started. The ship, the X, the guy in the X. The star with the feet, man. The star with the feet. And the arms. <laughs> yeah, I was like, nah. Nah. It was he, a friendly in. Is he muted? Yeah, he's muted. Okay. Now, now it's, now, here it is, ladies and gentlemen. Will you just look at it? Will you just look at it? Now, Diamond, go ahead and unmute and describe this to us, if you would, please, because you gave a great interpretation of this petroglyph. Oh, I was uh, actually making fun, but look, you have a guy inside of a star, a star man, a star man with feet. Um, and then this uh, upper area here is, uh, what is that? Is that a rocket ship, an engine? Is it a falling star? And this is the trail. Is it a comet? Is this people all getting killed by a comet? I mean. There's an arrow in it. Yeah. Is that what that is? An arrow stuck in the star, making it 
killing it and making it fall to the ground? Is this a fallen angel? Well, you know what's also weird is the symbol to your uh, left, right there at the uh, left point of there. It's a, just a white, white thing that's on a lot of stuff. And the reason I say that's an arrow is because I, I've seen a bunch of petroglyphs with the arrows in the rams, and they look exactly like that, like something shot at that, and it is coming down, and it does have a person in it. So I don't know what that is. Is that the tail, or is that the uh, the cape of Starman? So yeah, let's look. it's awesome. Okay, this is what I see. I, I see that that is their interpretation of showing a craft coming down from the heavens, in, an object coming down from the heavens, and then a bean comes out of it because yeah. it's clearly got a bean in it. And then it's got these feet or these like legs that come out. So as it lands, it has a way to land. And then, as you say, it's got what looks like an arrow to the left of it. And it looks like it's been tagged with the Spanish crusade crosses to the left after the fact. But this could be an asteroid. It could be a comet of some type or it could be a craft that landed and then they came out of this specific craft. Now, another thing that, you know, really interesting, you guys, I wanted to bring this up. You know, how the universe has these very bizarre synchronicities. And I talked to you yesterday about the hypothesis of maybe there was a rogue faction that built these great um, pyramids and some of these great mega structures. I was looking at these stairs last night on Pine Trist that are designed for 30 foot tall people. Like you wow. could be seven feet tall and you would have to like jump up and grab it and pull yourself up to get over it. And it's just insane. So maybe they built some rogue, well, let, let, me, let me finish with this. Maybe they built some rogue spaceship or something, launched off because they knew about these cataclysms. They, they stay close within the orbit. They genetically engineer beings to go do the work for them. And there's a lot of evidence to back that up. And people that have been studying these um, extraterrestrial phenomenons their whole life, like Daryl Sims, uh, which is a former, he used to work for the company and he's been a part of many different implant removals well anyway to make a long story short when i was talking about the spaceship yesterday when i brought that up later on that night i watched uh the last two episodes of shield season five and guess what there was a rogue spaceship building aliens and dropping them on planet earth from a rogue civilization i was like wow what a weird synchronicity but okay enough about that now let's get into the evidence not the conspiracy this is cool what are we looking at here it's a map yeah, this map we saw uh, at Rinconada Canyon, and it didn't have the airplane here and the star, which we just saw, and this other strange symbol here in the middle, and the UFO, and then the arrows coming from the center point. And then we have this connector here, like to the underworld, or and then the guy peeking around the corner, because this edge of the... Uh, rock here. Remember these circles? This is a guy's face on both sides. Uh, I saw the other angle. So this is insane. And then look at how this corner chipped off just like a UFO conveniently. <laughs> I, I literally believe that that is a map of the Central Valley of New Mexico right there. That big one at the bottom, and I'll show you the evidence for this. The big one at the bottom, you see the pyramid step thing? That's Sierra Blanca. That's a 12,000 feet high mountain down here. And I'll show you that later. And there's the shadow. Um, those other things, I believe, are other mountains north up there by Albuquerque and stuff. Let, you know what? Let me jump in for just a half second. What Diamond said there a minute ago about that one area that's connected to the mountain being an underground tunnel, that could be the underground facility to that mountain. There's probably a, connect, a connecting point there because I have seen this mountain projected on multiple petroglyphs yes. around multiple locations. Well, not only that. Carlsbad Caverns is to the south of that mountain right there, and it would be in that direction, which is a giant, one so, of the biggest caves in, in America. Maybe there, this, this is a big map, of the, a, a, a regional map, and that shows the entrance to the underworld, which would probably be that cave. Well, not only that, that's, right, that's where it. all of those uh, giant caves with the uh, crystals you've been seeing. They have some on the Mexico side and also on the New Mexico side. They're just these, the biggest crystals I've ever seen, you know, those giant gypsum crystals. And then we got the white sands that's made out of the same material. But you see that thing that looks like an airplane? Is that the international airport up to the north? <laughs> yeah, well, well, there's a thing to that. There's a shape almost like that on these rocks, and it always lands on the top of that pyramid mountain. It's always depicted next to it. Um, and I, at first I thought it was an arrow, but then I realized that it goes down, and it's more like a winged thing, and it's always... Like it's in multiple places, that same symbol. 
It's like well, a bird also, almost telling you that it flies. You know, another thing too, somebody made a great point. Somebody said, how do you know this isn't just kids graffiti? Well, that's a great question. And let me answer that. There are these same depictions and symbols and images around the four corners, as well as different parts of the world. Many of these symbols you can correlate with the ancient Sumerian, Babylonian, Mesopotamian, the Egyptian pantheon, the Greek, the Roman, the Hebrew. It's all also the Inca and the Maya. And I think Inca, there's a thing. Maya. Yeah. With, so uh, serpent guy. You know, another thing too, I think that y'all the Bayoff has absolutely you can look at y'all the Bayoff as astro theology as well with the Archon reference. And I think that y'all the Bayoff was depicted in many um, petroglyphs that I showed yesterday, and we can show here and again because it does show a lion head and a snake body. Now that could be the sun. That could be the sun of our solar system is what it's representing, some astrotheology. But what we just looked at there was fascinating because it does seem to be uh, uh, that the some mountain, an underground tunnel. And I've seen that mountain on different areas as well. And then I've also, I asked Diamond this question the other day. I said, well, hey, how do we know this isn't just like Santa Claus or mm -hmm. Thanos? There's a great movie like, hey, look, man, this is Thanos. He destroyed half the universe to save it in his own mind. Well, well this is their only way to write stuff down in stone. They, they, they couldn't record stuff. Unless they wrote it down. So this Rex, is can I real passing it on? Can I real quick jump in here? Please. And I yeah. really quick can uh, can, they, can everyone see this? Yep. Can you zoom in on that? I can't. I'm trying to, but I can't. Oh, there it is. All right. So here are some bizarre petroglyphs from all over the world that seem to be very similar. Some are more intricate. Obviously, the Egyptian hieroglyphs on the bottom much more intricate. But other people in other uh, continents are drawing very similar geometries. Uh, these are some of the most confusing glyphs that are totally unexplainable, but they're all very relatable when you put them side by side. Now, I'm gonna have to share a different screen now because I'm gonna quickly uh, bring you into the work of that, Anthony Peratt. Save that screen because I'm gonna blow your mind in a minute. Don't close. It. Okay, so that so back in the late early 2000s, Anthony Peratt if, on the top left started uncovering what's called the Peratt instability, which is the purple figure on the top left there. That was created at Los Alamos Labs using uh, high electricity in the plasma realms, very high electricity temperatures. Wow. Now these could be generated by our Earth in the polar regions. It's the same thing as the aurora borealis entering, you know, 18 degrees south of the equator there, in a circle, which is a Birkeland current, and it glowing. If we increase the electricity coming into the North Pole there, 10,000 fold, which is completely possible in the near future with our waning magnetosphere, what we would then get are these features emanating out of the North Pole instead of simply just aurora above that and emanating into space would be these huge glowing objects like the Peratt instability, which you can see from the glyphs would in Armenia. Go ahead. Would that be around the equator, the middle part there? Is that what you're talking about? Like around the equator? You no, would you, would, you would look north and this would be standing up on the North Pole of the Earth oh, and going okay. all the way up into space. So depending on where you were on Earth, you would get a different angle of the squatter man who would be standing on Earth on the North Pole, literally looking like God. And it would be creepy. And all of the glyphs that depict squatter man are facing south, which means they were looking north at him and drawing him on the rock. None of the rocks with squatter man are facing south because you can't, they would have to turn around. So they're literally looking at him and drawing him. All of these glyphs face south, which is pointing due north, where they're looking at him. Wow. So here's just some evidence of Squatter Man. Now, I can show you uh, real quick. We'll do Jacob's Ladder, and then we'll all talk about. Uh, so, yeah, let's just look at some Squatter Mans. Yeah, this, these these some stuff on some glyphs I was going to add. Look at these glyphs. These are not people. That is the Peratt instability. And that is in New Mexico. And we can get on to the, to the uh, Jacob's Ladder and the Tree of Life next. So do you want to just talk about the Squatter Man and that instability first? Yeah, let me, let's talk about this for a minute. And I want to just give uh, a quick 
thought to this, because when we've talked about the gods before Diamond and the electric universe theory and this phenomena, when, for example, Venus was captured and these other planets are attempting to, you know, come in terms with their orbit and their harmony and their frequency and these giant electrical currents that come down from the heavens. I mean, and I've talked before about how I think that these planets are beings and that the planets could be the gods. And you've said that if you take it back as far as you found, God does mean planet. So imagine these planets attempting to find their harmony and their connection, you know, their, their, their point in the universe. And they have to go through trials and tribulations just like we do. So there's the term as above, so below. And imagine seeing this phenomenon from the heavens, these giant electrical currents. Going, I mean, that, that's how else would you describe that? You're putting it down on stone and you're calling them gods because that's what they are. And we're on Google. Somebody took us to Google. What are we doing, Diamond? <laughs> you're on mute. <laughs> Yeah, that's weird. I was searching for something. I didn't know I'll if find it was it. Waterman, but I believe that I have several pictures of it. That's what you're calling it. Squatterman. Bizarre. And some I and gotta love it. What if he was doing this though? He was like, you know, he's doing some or he's like, Gish. but instead he's just like, hey, look at me, man. I'm letting it all out. That kind of makes you wonder lose, if that's man. where the uh, Atlas uh, Atlas guy depiction came from where he's holding the world it's like an upside down version of the squatter man he's holding the world right there in the polar configuration because the squatter man would have been right here well let's hope squatter man don't shrug like atlas did atlas shrugged good book very good book yeah. so yeah I'm, I'm ready to look at some pictures we got we got almost 600 people here live right now they're saying show us So who's Ransom? You gonna pull up some pictures for us? Yeah, sure. <laughs> All right. Start at the beginning here. Let's start at the beginning. And I'll fl I'll flip through some of these because they're kind of old and you can't really see what they are, but some of them are really obvious. So we'll just do that. All right. Can you see that? I'm sure it's got a delay. I'm sure. Yeah. Oh my goodness! I love that symbol. Yeah, and if you notice that this uh, serpent's here next to it, right? And there's a thing about this serpent thing. We've been seeing these serpents, and I know that the uh, there was a big thing about the Aztec going down to where the serpent people lived, the Maya, and they would know that was their new uh, place, and they were the bird people. And we've also seen the bird people all over the place. So I don't know if that has anything to do with their trip to the south where all the megalithic stuff is, but these sites all seem megalithic blocks, at least, that they draw on. Is that a brontosaurus? I don't know. You tell me. Just, just a random thing there. Oh, you're right. Look at that. Look at how. Go back to that. Okay. Let me move the Skype thing. And, and zoom. There's Birdman, but let's zoom it. That could be the Ajiji that are depicted also in the Sumerian cuneiform tablets and the Enuma Elish that we were created with the Enuma Elish and the Anunnaki. Now the Anunnaki could be the planet. So that's like saying that. Um, I mean, you could get that really deep into using the analogy of the planets. You're using the, the materials of the planets and connecting it to the DNA of the Ajiji, which makes the human very interesting. But this is awesome. Can you zoom in on that and then the, yeah. the dinosaur again? I think, though, um, if, you, uh, if you picked up those green rocks on the ground, well, this, uh, hold on, let me move my zoom crap out of the way here. There we go. All right, so... And you see this part that's broke off on the top here. That stuff's laying right down there, and it makes me think you could pick it up and put it back on there, and there's more story. Um, but, yeah, this hand is amazing, and I've never seen one like that anywhere. I mean, in other stuff, have you? I, I've seen it in Native American artwork with the Mississippian culture, but not out here in the Southwest. Well, the, the hand typically represents protection. And if you, I don't know if that's an eye in the center there, or if that's representation of the sun or this electrical current that they're seeing. So it's like protect us from this electricity that's shooting down from the heavens. And then the serpent, you know, I don't know if that's the Kundalini or the DNA, or um, I don't know, but that's definitely a fascinating image there. I've, I've also seen the hand that seems to show like a thumb on each side. 
in a sense. Well, it's really not a thumb on each side, but it, it, it kind of goes out like that with the fingers in there. But you also have petroglyphs of six fingers, which is fascinating. Yeah. But I want to look at this again for a minute. If you can zoom in on this, this is, it does look like a. It's just basic, and I'm not saying it is a brontosaurus, I, but I don't recognize an animal that has a giant neck like that. So I, I really don't know what this is. I'm not saying it's a dinosaur, but there are other pictures of things that look like pterodactyls on these rocks. So I don't know. I don't know how they would have known that. Uh, supposedly, this is only a thousand years old, according to the Bureau of Land Management. And uh, this, I actually think, is just, it is just a bird. But there are bird men on some of here, so I'll get to them. And there's your little star that you were looking at a minute ago with the guy in it. That's also everywhere. And What's the above it? Crab looking thing there. Could that but, be like the representation of a? Uh, which is it in the heavens that has that? Which constellation is it that has that symbol? Oh, the, uh, can, what is it? Not Cancer. Um, I forgot which one it is. The can No, I think it is Cancer's the crab, right? Um, but there's that. There's the steep mountain, and there's a hole in it on this picture, which is the only one like that. And then there's these weird big-eyed people everywhere. I don't know what that is. If that. And here's your birdmen. Like I said, some of these are basic, so I'm going to go through them pretty fast. But what's that? Is that your squatting man? And this is facing south. And uh, so you would be looking north, looking at this rock. Just like you were saying a minute ago, Diamond. I don't know if that's what that is, but you can see that they put two little dots. Uh, oh, shit. Sorry. Let me go back. Yeah, little, I can see that. Dots right there. I don't know. It looks real similar to those pictures you were showing. And like there's stuff so old that you can't really tell what it is. I mean, it's it's broken and it's uh, really you could tell it's, uh, you know, browner than the other stuff. And then there's these weird things like this. But I want to get to the uh, and, and you can tell on the tops there's a bunch of uh, stars and circles and stuff like that. And all of this is orientated, um, at least when the it's painted on the south north so there's only it only faces east west and and north i mean and south there's really not much on the uh south part let me show you let's get to this so what is that i don't know diamond um, what's your take on this there's giant uh, there's another giant one unfortunately i i didn't take a picture of it but it's in my video uh, this right here the fish the vertical fish You guys seeing a fish? I don't see. A fish. I saw a fish. Oh, a now I see. Uh, that was the last geometric line. pattern. Yeah. yeah. What? What is this? The, the fish could have been Pisces or something, even in the. Uh, well, I mean, the fish know. had crabs, uh, claws on that one. So I was thinking it was a crawdad, but there is a picture of a fish here in a second. It's also by the uh, hand. But I want to get Diamond's take on this one right here because you're going to see what looks like that sun symbol with all the dots around it to the left. You've got some weird anomaly to the, you know, to the left of that. If you can zoom in on this a little bit and yeah. let's go into detail on this for a minute. I think this is an important. Yeah. So I, I yeah. No now, idea. so look, let's, let's look at the sun symbol real quick. This is a simpler, simpler version of one I'm going to share in a second. That's next to the iron cross catastrophe uh, wheel that we talked about yesterday. And I was quickly thinking that there should be 12 dots around here. And they're not. And you start at the top here, which is not really at the top, a little to the left. Yeah. And you count one, two, three, four, five until you get to the nine o'clock position. And then six, seven, eight, almost at the bottom. So nine. Uh, so this is actually, I believe we got 18 on the last one. Let's see if there's 18 here. One, two, three, four, five, oh, right. six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So there's 15 dots on this one. Well, and I counted out most of them. They're usually eight or 16 or 12. Eight, 16, or 12. Well, well the 12 far, would there, be the one. There are some that are, uh, like you said, uh, have 15 for some reason. I don't know if they just didn't finish it or what. Um, but some of these are like Zodiac stuff. Like this one's just, I don't know, crossed. It's not really, it doesn't have any dots. But then see you see this object this is what i wanted to ask you about right here is this big object right here because it's on all the rocks and it's depicted in the sky with these other star things and it's over and over again on these rocks 
Matter of fact, there's a symbol on the shirt you were wearing at the last petroglyphs that's on one of these rocks. <laughs> and there's an older one. And I wanted to ask you about these nodules, too. You see these little bumps? Yeah. Uh, for some reason in this artwork, and if you can see, there was, th this is really old. It's almost gone. You can barely make out the picture on this rock. Um, but it has these nodules that stick up and these, whoever did these artwork made sure to use that as a portion of their uh, pictures all the time. So in this type of lava ransom, come down here to the bottom left. You see this really pointy angle at the bottom left? Sorry, yeah. The Sorry. crystal sticking out? Sorry about that. Those nuggets are uh, magnetic nuggets. They're magnetite crystals. So they were using the magnetism. Who's that? <laughs> now that's my kid there. Sorry, I used the wheel and it rolled around here. I got a shooting problems all of a sudden. There we go. All right. <laughs> yeah, see, these are magnetic crystals, probably of magnetite, and they knew that, and they used them for power, probably. This pointy angular crystal here is a magnetite in the bottom left. So yeah. that's also what these nuggets probably are. Okay. Well, they, they made so sure like they make that prominent, and yeah, that's my kid there. And there's your uh, squatting man again. Or something like it. I don't know what it is. But that shapes over and over again. The two points at the bottom, then the cross at the top. It looks like a head. Some of these are going to get real real detailed. And here's some guy with um, antennae with a flat head. <laughs> I don't know. Is that, is that supposed to be a bowl? Because it has eyes on it that you can't really see. And these are going to get more detailed as I, as I go here. And here's the, uh, like, they made sure to put human feet. I don't know about that one. That one looks a little crooked, like kind of bizarre. Um, what's that old tractor? <laughs> no, but you, you were saying yesterday that you can't, we can't as a modern people, uh, you know, relate to this the same way because some of these pictures, we wouldn't know what they are. And then they got all these circles, but I'm going to get to the really trippy stuff here in a minute. And there's another like squatting man in those, uh, these weird round things are everywhere, these little faces, or maybe they're stars. But I wanted you to look at this picture. This is a snake, and it's curled up on two sides of the rock. See? It starts up here, and it goes around, and it goes around to the other side of the rock. But it does have a snake head at the top. And then, uh, let's see, because there's the swastika. For whatever reason, they put that on there. Am I going too fast through these? Because it, it's about to get detailed here. So I no, don't want to do it for time. Oh, and this thing here. You're going to see this. Denver over Airport. Here. Denver Airport? <laughs> well, the Denver Airport has the same symbol. If you look at it from a bird's eye view, is that swastika that you just looked at. It's the same yeah. structure. Uh, what do you think this H thing is with a bar in the middle of it? Because there's a couple of really good ones here in a minute of this same, same symbol. And it usually is depicted like it's in the sky. So, and then there's like a little UFO thing. And like I said, someone damaged this rock recently. That looks like a craft. Yeah, there's a bunch of chips and uh, stuff down at the bottom. Somebody was banging on it with another rock. The rocks are still there at the foot of it. And I'm going to get to the colors because some of these you can't see, but let's see here. I have the better ones packed together over here. So that now, what is that kind of animal? I don't know. <laughs> That's a great there, picture. I mean, I, I mean, uh, picture. It, how's that, folks? Is that there? I'm not, I'm not trying to speed through them so fast, but there's like this uh, bird owl thing, and, and it's all over the place too. And there's a uh, kind of like a squatting man. This one looks really old, and I don't know if they had Microsoft Windows back then, but they have the window, you know, the Microsoft logo there. <laughs> but some of these animals, I, I don't know what they are. Like, what what would have big uh, mandibles and and regular legs and feet? You think that's something on its head? And, and there's your uh, mountain again. And it looks like uh, lightning or something hitting it. And this is facing towards the mountain. Let's see here, get through these. Oh, I wanted to show you that one. See this weird face, doesn't that look uh, pretty South American or maybe even African, this yeah. guy? 
Yeah, it does. And it looks like the one we saw the other day in Albuquerque that was on two different sides of the rock. Looks very similar. Yeah. And then here's this thing. Uh, some people are saying it's a Thunderbird, um, but it's there's some better, better depictions of it here in a minute. And then you get all of these uh, weird spiral things of squares, triangles. There's a lot of diamonds out here and you can see the Zodiac cross there like the other one. And they got these big stories on there. And Go have back to that one. Go back real quick. All right. And there's actually also three. No, not that one. The next one. Okay. The one with the little round shapes it on like, it. Look like snake people. Yeah, I'm not sure right what there. that is. Look at this. Look at this. One, two, three. And then there's, and there's Snake Man, y'all the Bayoth again, with three other snake dudes, but they don't have the big heads. Oh, there's some lizard people, though, here in a second. The lizards. Yeah, and nice. see, there's this stuff. I'm not sure what, you know, like, there's that's obviously a ram, or at least I think it is. That looks just like a ram. Um, and then there's more of these circles. That we could count the dots on this one. There's like a bunch of these circles, though. Not, not just one or two. There's like multiple different styles of it. And there's that looks like a Olmec head. He's got a helmet on, and he's not the only one at this site that's wearing a helmet. Can you imagine, Ransom, about 800 to 1,000 years ago, this area was like a hub for different beings. And uh, I mean, it's, it's, like instead of just an international airport, we're talking like an intergalactic airport. You know, people are coming out, like they're just walking in. You All of a sudden, you'll see, all of a sudden, you'll be like, Babe, I just got here, man. I came from the other side of the universe. Oh, this is a cool Stargate well, right here. This, to the west of this mountain, that we're, we're, we're right like on the foothills of Sierra Blanca. To the west is Roswell. And to the uh, east is White Sands. And then to the north is all that other stuff up there. And the river goes that way. This is the only spot you can get water anywhere around here for hundreds of miles. Now, tell me that don't look kind of like a really, really old African or Australian pick art right there and i don't even know what it is the giraffe because it tripped me out that thing we saw the other day it did kind of look like a rhino and that kind of looks like a giraffe but yeah why would that stuff be here unless people from over there came here maybe they were showing what kind of animals were where they were at um that would be a way to communicate if you didn't have the same language is to uh, show the animals where you're from versus the animals that are on the rocks already and there's one that I think looks like a uh, Toth here in a minute. And here's the really freaky one right here, or this is one of them. You can zoom in on that. We just look at right. it. And it's, it's not, or, this thing has fallen down, so it's not supposed to be sideways like this. You can see- That looks like an Ant-Man right there. Yeah, this is a really weird one. And, it, and he's got the picture of the stars there and it looks like, like a little horn. And like he was saying, this is another one with that, if that's magna, uh, magnet crystal or something, and that's the main portion of him right in the middle of his gut. So that's pretty bizarre here. That's a, kind of a sideways one. Or could, it, hey, wait a second. I just had, an, I just had a, a thought. If you look at some of these Egyptian hieroglyphics, They'll show a very similar image. I think it's new it. And it's it's like the god of the the it's, how do I put this? It's a god that represents the outside of the galaxy almost, like the Milky Way galaxy, maybe even the universe. And it's depicted very similar. If you were to go back to that image, um, I'll look for it and see if I can find it. And I've got a copy of the Book of the Dead, and then we can cross-reference it. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, a lot of these, uh, that's what I'm saying. I've seen them before on some of the other stuff you guys were looking at. A lot of them are basic like this, but I'm, we're going to get, so tell me this ain't, doesn't look like a pterodactyl on this thing. I'll flip it so we can look at it this way. Because I believe that's actually the original way it was on the rock. <laughs> what the hell is that? Some kind of bird. I'm not saying it's a dinosaur, but yeah, it looks pretty trippy. That looks like a crane. Possibly. But what's the thing on his head, though? Swamp there gas is. from Uranus. 
And the crane, so what is that? I'm not sure. More Birdman, this is facing north. I mean, or facing south, I guess. So you would be looking north on this guy. And he, they definitely put like a human face on these. So there's one of these lizard guys. It has a human head, but I'll show you one in a minute that they actually bothered to put a human face on it. And th this guy's holding some stuff. I don't know what it is. But you would say that, hey, that's just a lizard until I show you this one in a minute that it's obvious that it's standing up and it's like a humanoid guy. None of these are paint. Like the lizard ones look pretty obvious that they're trying to show a lizard, but some of these have human heads on it. And here's another one of these, uh, a different one in a different place, the Zodiac there with the, the dots on it. I didn't count this one, actually. So there should be a lot of dots on this one. This one's uh, pretty, looks pretty uh, more symmetrical than some of the older ones. So I don't know how many dots are on that. 22. 22. Who's that? I don't know what this guy is. <laughs> it looks pretty, pretty trippy, uh, whatever that is. And what, what's that? And why has he got a mustache or is that his mouth? I don't know. This is a, one, one of uh, many that, like uh, he was saying, that are built on the rock to use the curves of the rock as part of the picture. So this is like a big Olmec head. It's just sitting there. This is one of the biggest petroglyphs there. And if I could stop you for a moment, and if we could go back to that image, because I'd like to share with you Nuit, or Newt, which is the Egyptian solar disk. It's representation for the Egyptian solar disk. I want to show you what this looks Are like. Are you talking about the zodiac looking one or this uh, guy back here? The one before, go back right there, that one. All right. Let me... Let's stay focused on this for a minute. And I want to show you something, folks, because this, yeah, there you go. Well, no, take it back to where it was. You want it flipped the other, the other way? way? I want the hand, I want the hand going like this. There we go, right there. Yep. Okay. Well, that's the way it's sitting on the ground. It fell. Now, down. let me show you this. This is Newt or Newt. The Egyptian goddess sun disc. Buckle up. This is from Crystal Links. I mean, this the uh, the website, if you want to look and study more into Newt. Oh, wow. Newt. And this is representation of the Egyptian solar disc, a very powerful goddess form. And it looks very similar to what you just showed. And you'll see there's many depictions of Newt or Newt, where you'll have different archetypes and gods and beings and people inside. And this you'll see also the travelers. You see those boats right there? Um, I have friends that were on the show that went to the Great Pyramid of Giza and different areas out there. And they had the exact same experience where they were in those cosmic boats. They even went into wow. the, the sarcophagus in the king's chamber, the temple of Isis. And I want to talk about those temples out there. Um, the ridiculous story that their tombs is, is absolutely ridiculous. And most people know better. Well, I don't know about that. Many, most people listen to Leak Project know better, I would say, because they, they can think for themselves and they're not as assimilated as most people. But these things, actually, when they were there, their phones, for three hours, they were in there and they were using their phones, re recording. Their phones didn't lose any energy. They stayed the exact same the wow. whole time they were there. It was as if they were staying powered in there. And that would explain the Christopher Dunn hypothesis, the Giza power plant. And then later in life, after this cataclysm, that thing was built tens of thousands of years ago. After that cataclysm, the people that made it out and survived attempted to mimic what they saw. It's like, okay, imagine, so here's a really good analogy. Something bad happens. And let's say 10,000 people, let's say 100,000 people survive. Well, let's say 10 million people survive around the world, 10 million people. And we come back out and we're like, hey man, I need to make a phone call. And you got a cell phone, right? But could you make one? I mean, do you know how to make it? And then could you make the satellites and the towers and everything else that's connected with that? We would have to rebuild and it would take yeah. a long time to do. And I feel that there are these enormous beings at one point, the builders, that communicated telepathically. And then all these cataclysms that have happened. And then what we're looking at right now, these petroglyphs are remnants of the about 12, I'm saying about 1200 probably. Many of, many of these are probably from around that time when there are these volcanoes going off and many cataclysms that are linked to certain cycles that Diamond has presented. And it was their way of, of protecting humanity.
And now we're going to look at something which is insane and incredible and definitely, uh, I mean, it's the synchronicities here are phenomenal. So go yeah, ahead. I thought so. I'm are you going to talk about this? Hello. Yeah. He's just the mute. Let me unmute him. I got you. Unmute. You got me. You're unmuted. Okay. So take a look this, uh, I just put this together before we uh, started talking, uh, and had this meeting and ransom just showed us, uh, this symbol again and again, different versions on the right here. And yesterday we were talking about the work of Randall Carlson. He put together the Zodiac here on the iron cross, which is the great year. And this combines multiple uh, groups of mythology all in one. It includes the Vedas and it includes, you know, the Greek mythology in the left side. And it's clear, just like you were saying about, you know, the giant builders, teaching like Gobegli Tepe is, is a encyclopedia of knowledge that was passed on to those that survived. They still knew a thousand years ago, all the ancient astrology, they knew about the iron cross. They knew about cosmic catastrophe. And I think that this petroglyph on the right from New Mexico is clear evidence of that. What are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I mean, when you were showing that graph the other day, that's exactly, I thought, wow, that is exactly like the glyph. Uh, one of the best ones there with that iron cross in it. And that's not the only one. There's some that are more like lines that are uh, got the outer circles like Zodiac, like the actual Zodiac wheel. It's obvious they're talking about the same information. Does that have 18 dots around it? Did you notice that the one is uh, empty? Does it, the reason I asked, does this have 18 dots around it? Because if it does, the 18 would be significance to maybe 18,000 years. There's got to be some connection there. And some type of cycle point is what's going through my mind. And this also reminds it's seven, me. Seventeen. Seventeen dots. Okay. So, Diamond, what would the significance be if you were to say 17? Is there a 17,000-year cycle? Is there a 1,700-year cycle? Actually, there, I don't know. If you count that one that's hollow, it could be two dots there representing a time. Because that's the only one that's like that. If you notice, all of the other ones are filled in, but there's one that's... Uh, a lot of people are also saying 18 in the in the live chat. It's hard to see one of those because it's so weathered. But I would think it would be it would make more sense if it was 18, just because you know you've got that um, it's an it's an even number. And 18 you can use as the the 12 months of the year. Then you could use the six as the half, and then you could use the four points, the cardinal points. And I'm, there might be some unless it's 17 for a, a certain you know 1700 years, 17,000 years. I don't know. But also. I'm thinking of the crossing. I'm thinking of Nibiru as yeah. more of not a planet per se, but actually a cycle because Nibiru is talked about in many ancient tablets. It will say Nibiru. doesn't well, say it's a was. planet that comes around every 3,600 years, but it does describe Nibiru. And also keep in mind that these are translations. So even if it was Oxford or Harvard or Yale or any university that translated this text, it doesn't mean they're right 100%. I mean, try translating something that I'm going to say with slang if you came yeah. here and didn't know what I was referring to. Well, you know that just the idea of it being a planet could, would, would uh, be marking the cycle. Like that would be a major point that they would say, here's part of the cycle that it's at this point. It's weird to me that on his graph, though, um, it, it looks exactly like that, except for like, uh, you know, these are marks of time. Is that the time goes from the end outward, right? So if you're looking at the iron cross here, this where all the dots are is where we are down here on this dot where 26,000 years ago was the onset of the last glacial period. So that we came all the way around and we're sitting back on this dot right now today at zero and we're ticking this ticking through it. These cross points here that are shaded in uh, orange are the times on Earth when we have catastrophe, the worst ones right on the flexure point. So these are like zones of upheaval, if you listen to Randall Carlson, which would correspond to the open circles. Yeah, Times of upheaval are the open circle period on the glyph. And the, so and there's the, a whole lot of time, like 1,400 years of upheaval in each of these zones, which were just standard, unfortunately. This, this is also a, uh, 
they made sure to put this on here at the cardinal directions too. So the empty circle there points north. Well, which one? The one on the left? Yeah, the left, the left one that has the circle. Right next to that is the rock with the the leak project hand, but it, it points north. So, and then um, the top would be uh, east, and that points directly towards the mountain. So it's it's like the cardinal directions. If you're looking at the rock, it tells you which way is which. Like multiple purposes on it. Yeah, like a lot of this stuff was. Yeah, let's look at some more pictures or um, go into some different data that would – I want to talk more about the cycles. We, we did discuss this yesterday, Diamond, but I think this is really important because not a whole lot of people are discussing the scientific evidence that's linked to these – I don't want to call it apocalyptic, but definitely catastrophic because these events that take place uh, seem to be – like right now where we're at – we could be entering a time of either incredible opportunities or like we've talked about before, is there going to be some type of electric discharge and, and solar flares and people are going to be, you know, get evaporated. Like, we've, like maybe these canyons, like you said, this, these giant lightning bolts came in and just evaporated the whole area. My neighbors just got back from the Grand Canyon. They said they loved it out there. I said, did you hear about the electric universe theory? They're like, no, what's that? So it's about a giant, basically cosmic lightning bolt that created the, the Grand Canyon. They're like, well, that sounds fascinating. So let's talk about that. Well, what's weird is if you guys notice, these are all of these petroglyphs are near places that had severe volcanic activity at one time. And some of the rocks there at Three Rivers look like, uh, you know, you could still see the, uh, the way that the rock melted and they used that as part of the uh, thing there. Yeah, most of these megalithic sites uh, show some type of catastrophe uh, associated with them. Um, but we're talking, when we go back a thousand years, these areas were much wetter and green and it was much different. And it's only now when we're going out there that we're like, how did they live there? There was a lot more water back when the people were actually there. And it's the events a thousand years ago, like all those volcanoes in Arizona we drove by, all the Kilauea type uh, uh, lava flows that cover New Mexico and Arizona in the north. That, is, that all just happened a thousand years ago. So I'm sure that people didn't want to stick around for that. It was hell on earth. But what triggered those events? What triggered the fall of Rome? It was a cosmic event. It was a grand solar minimum, similar to the one we're going into. Um, it's a bond cycle also. It's the thousand year climate cycle. So, and the one we're entering into is unlike the, the past several thousand years. So we have the fall of Rome and the fall of the Minoans the one we're entering into now is also corresponding to the 11,500 year magnetic reversal. Uh, and when the magnetic reversal occurs, the magnetosphere of earth wanes towards zero. And as it gets compressed, more cosmic radiation comes in. And it also might mean that more cosmic debris comes in. So uh, a lot of people are under the impression that in the near future, we're going to have a lot of impacts on earth even if they're small objects like a kilometer or less, uh, this would wreak havoc on, uh, you know, everyone, 80% of humanity lives on the coast. Yeah. So if you start dropping kilometer rocks in the ocean, which is where they will hit because the planet is 80% ocean, you're going to have, you know, 600 foot tsunamis wiping out massive swaths of humanity in the near future. Um, with that being said, also, the um, like Gobekli Tepe, if we go back and look at that structure as an example, it seemed as if they buried it so that they could, uh, you know, so that in the future, because they knew about something was going to happen, people would be able to unveil that and say, yeah, let's, let's connect the dots here. What do you think the best thing to do, Diamond? Because you are the change, man. You are preparing. You are very knowledgeable in growing crops and food and how to live off the grid. You have been off the grid for the past three years. I mean, not completely off the grid, but you were up in the mountains getting ridiculous. How do you do it, dude? I mean, are you cold right now? I'm already getting cold out here. Crazy. I just turned the heater on next to me. <laughs> but we have a fire burning. Oh, yeah. And first, I would suggest everyone to move to a state where cannabis is legal. And then uh, additionally, 
Um, you know, there's hundreds of resources on where you can learn to survive and thrive off the grid. You can't be scared about the coming events. You need to be prepared. The way that the groups made it through is they were prepared. If you study ancient cultures, if you don't have enough stockpiles, you know, in your coffers and the, and the stuff hits the fan, you're dead. That's so right. you need to layer your preparedness with wild crafting and sustainability farming. And, and you also have to be mobile. Like if there's no food here, you have to know where to move to where there is food. Uh, create a barter system, micro communities, live near where there's caves, know where the ancient people went to hide because yep. we may have a scenario where stuff's hitting and falling in and there's a debris field and we got to go in a cave for a week. It's hard to tell what happened in the past, but it was crazy. And, and the last event 11,500 years ago uh, that occurred where the last remaining humans buried Gobegli Tepe after they carved it. I mean, literally think of the amount of time and work it took to carve this site, make it astronomically perfect and then bury it. They, the, they saw the earth was being destroyed to that level. And they knew that that amount of work was needed to prepare or to save this for future humanity. And we uncover it and we're like, oh, it's nothing. It's, a, oh, this is great. They were skull cult. That's what the AAS said two years ago, a skull cult of a bunch of hunter gatherers that didn't know anything, scraping skulls and they're cannibals. That's what the mainstream told us about Gobegli Tepe. I got a question for you. Clearly then. that's, <laughs> Go back way, way, you're saying like 11,500 years or 12,000 right in there. So at the end of the Pleistocene, correct? Um, right here at White Sands, they say that this other stuff is a, only a thousand years old, right? But there's foot, human footprints chasing down giant cave sloth and stuff embedded in this valley. So we know there were people here hunting stuff at the end of the uh, Pleistocene. So there were obviously people in the same valley and they say it hadn't changed for millions of years. It goes beyond that ransom. Uh, the first lot we bought, Oppenheimer Ranch, the, the first month I found evidence of Clovis. These are people that were here hunting mammoth on my land 13,500 yep. years ago. And almost everywhere I go, this area, the, the Pueblo region, yep. there are some of the biggest mammoth kill sites, Clovis, New Mexico. There is evidence that there were millions of people here 14,000 years ago. We don't get taught that in school. It's being lost. Everyone walking the earth should know that North America was filled with millions of Solutrians in the 16,000 years ago, the Clovis people 13,500 years ago. These were groups of people that could harvest a thousand mammoths at a time by forcing them off a cliff by extreme tactical measures. And we have uncovered the kill sites and the process sites where they potentially process over a million pounds of mammoth meat over a one month period. That would take 10,000 skilled butchers. And I mean, and it's not going bad because the people aren't dying. They know how to process it. They're making jerky like jerky factories. So we don't know anything about these people. We've been lied to from the beginning and you can't take anything for what they tell you, basically. Yeah, actually Clovis is just Northwest of this stuff that we're looking at. <laughs> I mean, it's not that far away. It's like uh, right on the other side of that valley where Roswell and stuff to the North of that. So this whole area yeah, so seems to be one of those places that people went at like you're talking about that knew how to do stuff. They knew where to go. They knew where it'd be stable. And look where we ended up. Whew, thank God. <laughs> yeah. There's a massive lava field there. So at one time there was uh, something going on, but there's no volcano there. So I was going to, you're the, you know, into the rocks. How does that happen? Unless there's a, well, one of the, the one of the theories uh, that the electric universe allows us to have that no geologist has is if you start blasting these thunderbolts from the ionosphere to the surface, you can melt, you're going to be melting the rock underground. And then if it happens in a giant lightning bolt from space in a few days or hours, you're going to melt a huge amount of lava that's underground. It's going to come up through cracks and just ooze out on the surface exactly like we see in those areas where there's no volcano. So we just don't have the electricity as a toolkit, but now we do. So you can use 
a lightning from space in the electric universe theory to basically have a mechanism for these huge lava flows that you're talking about, like the one there on the left in Three Rivers. Yes. So these are Kilauea type ah uh, ah uh, lava flows. They move real slow. They sound like breaking glass, and yeah. basically they won't kill you. But yeah, and see, but and you this, can get them. So these people were right there next to this this ridge that they put all these petroglyphs on. It, it follows this uh, lava trail, <laughs> and right down here at White Sands is where they found the oldest evidence, supposedly, is what they're saying uh, in North America of human beings killing megafauna that would be like right over here at the white sands track so it's all and this mount this is this giant mountain right here that they they depict and then right on the other side that is roswell and clovis so this whole area like you were saying they were hunting down megafauna yeah indeed oh wrong button sorry stop share that so i just want to say too i'm also thinking about what it must have been like at one point and whether it was 800 years ago, whether it was 8,000 years ago, 80,000 years ago, 800,000 years ago, at one point, it seems as if this planet, there were beings of un unprecedented proportions that we just can't even imagine that were here among us. They were working with us and we were all like happy. It was, uh, it was more of like a multi-intergalactic centerpiece. And now whatever happened, it seems as if we were in this how do I put it? We're like in this hypnotic state of suppression where we, we don't know where we come from. We don't know why we're here. We don't know where we're going, but we have all these ancient teachings and such that tell us where we came from, who came here, you know, who the Kings came from, etc. But we don't really know. There's so much information out there that all we can do is take the information and use our gut and, and continue to research. But why, why don't we know? And why, if there was a thousand years ago where there are all these beans and people working in harmony together, then why aren't we still doing that? I think my gut right now is telling me that maybe, you know, obviously natural disasters and catastrophes, but I think there was some kind of war. Something bad happened where, you know, we were going after them, they were going after us, and we were all fighting each other, and we're here now, and they're not. And if they are, they're underground or they're cloaked or something, or, we don't, or just maybe they're in a different frequency, and they're, you know, we're only using 0.01%. We only see with 0.01% of the electromagnetic light frequency. And then our brains filter out about 50% of that. And that's scientifically proven. So think about how much we don't see that could be right in front of us. But I think that something happened and that's why you know, something bad happened. And maybe like you said, Diamond, remember we were talking about the natives and you said they used to be really peaceful, but then they turned into a war. You know, a lot of them started fighting each other and it was because they needed the resources. It went from a, uh, Garden of Eden, almost worldwide or close to worldwide to something happened in the heavens that changed the earth. And then they started to battle each other. So maybe that's why we don't have the full disclosure. Maybe we're a lot, maybe the people, maybe humans, not us, but maybe there's some humans out there that are just a lot worse than any other ant man or something like that. Cause they were, cause they just think differently. Maybe, you know, for someone that doesn't have a conscience, a human being that doesn't have a conscience, could be a lot more dangerous than any extraterrestrial with a conscience. Like what are your thoughts? How many, how many of these people do you think were running around like different? A lot. Just because you think, yeah, well, I, Cyclops. what if 11,500 years ago during uh, the younger Dryas event, which we now know is a cosmic catastrophe uh, the Vedas, we were just talking here, my friend next to me about, they describe nuclear war. Um, and over in North America now, we've uncovered things. Like if you go over to Randall Carlson's site, he just put up a video on the Carolina Bays. It's one of the best. There are over 10,000 sub-impact sites on the East Coast of North America. No one knows about this. They all happened 11,500 years ago. And they're not impact craters, but what they are, are these unexplainable depressions. But if you use the electric universe theory, what they are is the same as, as um, the Tunguska event. An object enters our atmosphere and explodes due to plasma discharge from the surface. It's a different charge. It turns green and then it explodes. It vaporizes a kilometer or two above the surface. Um, it literally would 
create the Libyan glass uh, in the deserts of Africa and all of those unexplained cosmic things. This happened 11,500 years ago. It erased the giants and all the advanced civilizations that had been building the megaliths for 100,000 years prior. The event that just happened is the 100,000 year event. So it's a big event 11,500 years ago. And maybe they crossbred with us right after the catastrophe. Some of their genes are in the benevolent ones and some of the genes of the evil people are, are a different uh, homo sapien. But maybe there was like some last minute genetic modification during the catastrophe to preserve their genetics within us. We now know that many uh, of us have the Cro-Magnon gene this brings hominids back mil uh, millions of years, and it brings modern man back millions of years, just like us, no different. So if we have the same brain capacity a million years ago, and yeah. we didn't get have a cosmic catastrophe for 100,000 years, where would we be? Where, where is our technology going to be in 100,000 years if the, the stuff doesn't hit the fan? It would be unimaginable, unimaginable. You know, let me add. And it Diamond, if you're still talking, please continue. I was just going to say the, the singularity I'm thinking about, you're saying 100,000 years. Once radio waves are discovered, then it takes about 200 years, according to Kurzweil's theory, which I strongly agree with much of it. I was actually having the same hypothesis and speculations before I even read his book, The Singularity. Um, genius. And he says within 200 years from discovering, inventing the radio, you're going to go from a, where we're at now to what we could consider a type three civilization, which means we can harness the power of the entire, the entire solar system, the entire galaxy within 200 years from discovering radio. Now think about that for a minute. <laughs> so what, what you're bringing up is, is fascinating. We've talked about this before because you think that the only way to get out of this or one of the only ways that we're going to get out of this complete control of a system that becomes mechanical, not organic that just digitizes everything, assimilates everything, uses us as nodes and servers. I mean, it literally could use us as servers. They can store more storage and DNA than they can in any hard drive you can go buy at the store. Um, it's like 215,000, no, I'm sorry, 215 million gigabytes of information they can store right now in one gram of DNA. And that's increasing. So yes, so you think that, that we need these events Otherwise, there's going to be this technology that's so far advanced that it could consume entire galaxies as a snack. Yeah. <clears throat> and then burp it out. Technology outpacing <laughs> the organic growth. But, but, you know, <laughs> but maybe there's a balance. Like for every, for every problem, there's got to be an answer. So every action has an opposite reaction. No good deed goes unpunished. So the greater we become... The, the greater destruction is on the opposite spectrum to balance it out. So there's going to be a point where they meet and then it's like reset, start over. I think we're in the great reset right now. Yeah. But what if one of uh, these species during the last, the antediluvian period, what if they became uh, so omnipresent they became so amazing they reached a higher dimension during the catastrophe they helped us little cave dwellers get along and they were able to ascend to a different place in a different dimension and they do help us and visit us because like rex said they had a hundred that maybe they had ten thousand years after they found radio waves and who knows where they got they don't necessarily have to be evil and consume the universe they could be our gods the benevolent ones the the, where the love comes from, the source energy. And they can't really manifest down here in hell on earth in our three-dimensional linear death time hell. And then why would you want to come down here? So they really don't interface down here. There might have be multiple entities like this that have evolved on this planet in the time scales we're talking about. If you think in 200 years after you find a radio wave, you, you become a space robot, Think about it. What, what would that space robot look like? Well, I'm under the impression here that if it gets to a certain point, like you said, and this, there's a lot of people that speculate, why aren't we seeing beings all around us? Well, maybe if you get to a certain spiritual enlightenment, that was a really cool petroglyph, by the way. You go, you just, you're not even in this universe anymore. You're not even here. Like you could go out a billion trillion light years away, but this universe is of a specific frequency of a specific spectrum. So when you evolve like a true evolution, 
they're just not even here. So maybe that's what happens to certain beings that get to a specific level. And then the other people that are out there that are just like us on a planet far, far away, we just don't have technologies right now to see them. But they could definitely be there. The question is, does it take an interdimensional being to get here? Or are there technologies that could get somebody like you, like me, and like others that like to listen to Leak Project and other programs like the Oppenheimer Ranch Project? Freedom There's that Films. sample that I was showing you a minute ago. Sorry. Can we share that. this? Yeah, turn that off. Can you turn, turn that it off? off? Yeah, I don't know if, I mean, whose is that? I don't know who's. That's not me. Oh, that was, oh, that was Diamond? Yeah. Was that, was but that? Uh, it was funny, it looked like that petroglyph I showed you earlier. The circle. Can we share that? I don't know, is it public domain? Yes. Oh yeah, then sure, absolutely. If it's, yeah, create Okay, a so uh, what a lot of people don't know is that in the near past, the earth we live on was a much different place where the people living on the surface didn't see stars. The only thing they saw to the north was this polar configuration. And what it was, the large dark, dark shadow here is Saturn and Mars and Venus are all lined up in a straight line. And at some point in the recent past, this large mountain started to grow up from Earth from the North Pole. This is all plasma discharge, kids. This is not a real mountain. And, but they were different colors like the Aurora. So they changed reds and greens and all of the mythology comes out of this polar configuration. And recently, and I think within the last 10,500 years or, or in that time frame, is when the creation myth occurred. And when this configuration ripped apart, Saturn had to go out here and Mars went to its place and Venus had to go in the inner solar system. And when this event occurred, the plasma sheath that we were living under, which was the Garden of Eden, perfect temperature, perfect moisture, never rained, was ripped away. And a bright light emerged, which we now call the sun, which started traversing across the sky. Prior to that, the sun never moved. It was always in the northern polar configuration, and it was always present and always there, never moved. And recently, these planets, which used to be called the sun, which was actually a stack of planets, in the North Pole, ripped apart. And during that ripping apart, we have the war of the gods in the heavens, where Mars and Venus fought and plasma discharge occurred. And I believe those are the times when the Grand Canyon and the Valles Marineris on Mars were formed. And humanity with the new sun during creation witnessed these catastrophes of epic proportion. And we have so far to go to pick it apart but this is something that if you're not aware of, check out thunderbolts.info to get back to the source information, which I think uh, the Egyptians knew very well about the, compolar, the polar configuration. And we're just starting to uncover this. That's fascinating. And it also, once again, reminds me of at one point, this whole planet had a much more harmonious environment and whatever happened to kind of take that sheet away or that protection barrier, now it's a lot more extreme. Now it's a lot more of a, a duality, I guess you could say. And even the lifespans that we're dealing with now, um, most people aren't living nearly as long as those that are talked about in the Sumerian King list. And the, the, um, the Hebrew texts, there's a lot of information that you can find in texts previous to those from the Sumerians and uh, ancient Mesopotamia but they use, for example, Adam only lives for what, 800 or 900 years in the Old Testament that most people have access to. But if you read the Sumerian king list, Alulim, which was the first king and the first, uh, the kingship was descended from the gods in heaven. Well, Alulim is most likely Adam and Alulim, I think, uh, was a ruler of his rulership lasted over 28,000 years. So you know it's that. interesting how they get those things mixed up. That's weird that he was talking about all these plasma discharges. You know, in the Sumerian text, they, they talk about when Marduk came by uh, Tiamat there. It doesn't actually say that it hit it, but it does talk about divine lightning bolts. And Tiamat, yeah, so you know, here, like part, part of it was ripped away. It doesn't actually say it, it collided with it or anything like that. It talks about, uh, you know, like you said, big lightning bolts hitting it, like a big discharge of uh, static between the worlds. Wow. 
Yeah. So when when the polar configuration is ripping apart is when the Pratt instability in the North Pole would have been happening, which is which would have given us Jacob's ladder and the stick man with those dots. And and here's the experiment. Um, where you can see the Jacob's ladder forming through plasma, the plasmoid conceptual geometry on the left, petroglyphs to the right, where these cultures are watching the morphology of the plasmoid change. When we showed you that conceptual picture a moment ago, it's just part of the, the changing. And then the bird head is also part of the changing. When Mars and Venus first separated, the plasma on the left here, this is another plasmoid by Peratt, appeared to be a bird head on top of that mountain coming out of the north. And, and they would have, and then Rongo Rongo, if you don't know what that is, that's Easter Island. They have a detailed account of this plasmoid changing. And I think the petroglyphs reveal that. Here's the science behind the petroglyph. The plasmoid is the Taurus or the eyes. Now, Ransom, you showed some great petroglyphs of this Taurus. This could be visible in the night sky to the north if we increase the electricity coming into our planet, which is going to happen in the future. The dicotron instability are the steps of the ladder. The Birkeland current is the column and the terminus are the antenna. They could have been looking at ant people in the, standing on the North Pole. And the ant people could have warned them because they could have seen this plasmoid before the stuff hit the fan. So maybe there could, there might not have been ant people. Maybe they just saw this weird ant person glowing, standing on the North pole. <laughs> well, I was about to say something real quick because before you even said that, I'm like, that looks like the ant bean. It's got the eyes on the bottom and it's got the antennas on the top. And those same things are depicted. And that that's a possibility However, with my own experiences and, and from the other stuff that I've seen around the world with these, um, you know, with also the hieroglyphics where they were showing these ant beams moving with humans to create the pyramids. I think that they are actually, they're real. I think whether they're intergalactic, interdimensional, um, they're, you know, just physical and their technology, but that does have some incredible similarities there. And then again, you could say, hey, as above, so below, because if you look at a cell, and you look at your body at a microscopic level, you're going to see these protons and neutrons and electrons moving around in certain, you know, they have certain orbits and stuff like that, just like the planets and the stars do. So it's, uh, you know, it's like the microcosm coming from the macrocosm and this holographic universe simulation matrix that we're in right now. Let me show so you this picture and tell me what you think it is. Because it, if you turned one of these sideways, it looks a little similar, but it's not like any of the other petroglyphs there. It looked like one of those symbols on your shirt the other day, but let me show you here. It, it's pretty i'm we're gonna I, leave we're gonna I, leave links for all of these just real yeah, quick remember where. we're gonna leave links for all of these um in the video description box folks except for the personal pictures of the petroglyphs which you can just watch the videos but all the other stuff we're gonna have links directly so just click the link and then you can go specific to the site and learn more about it as well what do you think that is does that not look familiar it's like a bunch of nodes assimilate don't assimilate assimilate don't assimilate electric not electric magnetic that's cool. Yeah, that, it does look familiar. Absolutely. I don't know what exactly That it looks is. like the art you just bought on its side, the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't think about that. And some of these rocks aren't in their original places. So it could be, you know, at a different angle there. I think this would be. Up. Yeah, there you go. Would you look at it? Yeah. Ladies now and it looks a little more familiar, don't it? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, would you just look at it? Would you just look at it? All right. <laughs> That's so, awesome. But there, there's some more of these oh, that are like, yeah, that's the only one like that that I saw, though. There could be more. But that that just looked, it's different than all of the other depictions of things. It looks like something like uh, either a molecule or like an energy thing or something. They were definitely trying to depict an idea that you would recognize when you looked at it if you knew what it was. I like that. Yeah, that's got eight nodes. Now, the Tree of Life has more than that, but the that could be a simplistic version of the tree of life. Like what the natives looked at is the steps, the ladder to get into enlightenment. And, you know, I want to say one thing before we, we close out that I was thinking about last night, I've been just an extremely deep thought uh, for the past, I don't know, 12, 14 hours. I, I didn't get much sleep last night either. And um, back in the day when I was like 19, I met this guy that was very, I don't know, it's like mystical. He would say things that would, a week later, you'd be like, oh, that's what he was talking about. He, he spoke in parables and stuff like that. And I remember one time he was talking to me about these different levels 
of, of spiritual evolution. And he was talking about the planets and I don't remember all of it, but the feeling I'm getting right now is overwhelming. Like, like hairs standing up on my, my eyebrow hairs are standing up right now. It's bizarre, but he was talking about the different planets and the different levels of consciousness and how we're actually going to go through these different planets. And I'm wondering if where we're at right now, and for example, the Baba Chakra, the ancient Egyptian will of destiny and karma and stuff, if that is true. Um, for example, if let's say the next location we go to would be something like Jupiter or Mars or not Mars. I think Mars is probably before Earth. It's more of a, a war planet, but I don't know. I mean, that's just the first thing that came to mind. But let's say we go to Neptune or something like that. We wouldn't be this physical body, but we would be an energy of some sort. And our medium of consciousness would just not be in this physical form. So when you read through the Gnostic text and it describes how this body is the lowest form and the body was made by demons and the mother of matter is, uh, is uh, the mother of all demons. And it took 365 angels and demons to create us. And that connects to the days, the months, the planets and everything. And it's all connected to this body that we're in. What if the higher evolution we go, we literally are manifested like our frequency, you know, our spirit we leave. And instead of being recycled on this planet, if we go to the next one, it's like, and then we're in Neptune. And then we're like this water being that's just fluid and absorbing more consciousness. And then Saturn is like the ruler, Satan, the adversary of the sun. So we go through all these planets and these spectrums. Then we get to Saturn and we have an option to start over. And then some people make it through that Saturn and then go through the sun as like a star, like a soul, like a, um, a sun, or I mean, a, a, a soul gate. And then we go to a, another level of consciousness, similar to what's described in the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, when they describe the false light and the light that most people don't make it to. What are your thoughts? And we'll close on that. Well, you almost sound like you were talking about a DMT trip and you know that they have a new, uh, they have a, a guy that has built a machine. I've never that, done that. Oh, I'm not saying you did. I'm just saying it sounds like I haven't either. It sounds like the depictions of it or, or what people describe. Not yet. You go through a, <laughs> you go through a threshold, right? And, and you meet beings on the other side. So this isn't a physical journey. But um, scientists believe it enough that they've now built a machine that will uh, intravenously give you a drip to stay on the DMT trip longer than a few milliseconds that people do when they smoke it pure. Now, like ayahuasca is a really, uh, you know, it's not very concentrated, um, but people have the trip there. But the people that smoke it uh, in its pure form go to another place like the natives in South America talk about them doing and they meet somebody, but they've actually built a machine to let someone stay there longer to try to bring back information. And they think that there's a theory that that's going to be the travel of the future. When we meet other beings, it'll be because they've discovered the same thing and the same molecule, which is also the same molecule that floods your brain when you die. So when you die, you go on a trip somewhere else, as long as your brain didn't get destroyed. But Oh, That's awesome. I couldn't agree more. The human body is the same as a television set. It is a electrochemical bag of water. A television set's a dry version. Imagine if television sets were made of water with the chemical ele electricals in there. So the human body is an electrochemical bag of water. The consciousness is coming from the universe into our brain somehow. We have an antenna, our body, that picks it up. Without the body, the TV, we can't, you, if you turn a TV on that's unplugged, meaning we didn't eat and we're not alive, it won't show you anything unless it picks up the signal. So the human body is just a biological computer that's picking up our consciousness from the source. And I, I believe that I am my consciousness, not my body. My body isn't me. It's going to die. But my consciousness has is is been eternal. It has always been here. And it is now connected with this t television. Diamond is connected. But I'm going to go back out wherever I go into Sirius or through Orion's nebula when this television set gets broken. But I think that our consciousness has been infinitely here and we get to experience things forever. We just don't know it when we're idiots as humans, unfortunately. Right. One more picture, Rex, and you tell me, is this Toth? Because that's what I immediately thought of when I saw this petroglyph here. Um, because it doesn't fit with the other stuff either here, so hopefully I shared the right one, right? The crane. It looks like that, uh, 
you know, that like his head there, but I don't yeah, know what yeah. the symbols are above there. It's the only one kind of like that there too. It does. Like, and, and, and I didn't I even can't... show you guys the alien stuff. What's Say that? that time. I didn't even show you the alien looking glyphs. We'll say oh, that. Dude, we're, then we need to get you back on tomorrow. We'll do it again tomorrow. Um, because yeah, that, that deserves its, uh, its own episode. Yeah. That's why I was asking how many different peoples do you think they were here? Because um, some of these rocks depict, you know, people up close, different looking things. But there's this one figure that's always depicted as off in the distance. And there's even they've even used the crack of the rock to make it look like he's looking around it. And it's a really alien looking thing with no mouth. It's just got eyes and a weird square head. Well, ladies and gentlemen, well, let me stop this. Sorry. Would you just I, look at it? I thought it looked like Thoth to me. And there's some kind of moon symbol and a couple dots above it that, I, you know, I'm not claiming to be able to read the stuff. I'm just saying. Dude, if that's a moon symbol, the crescent moon with yes. two dots above it, that would also correlate with Thoth. And I, I think that's awesome. Thoth is one of my favorite archetypes, great energy. You could say Thoth is the archetype of thought. So that's, that's fascinating. And, and folks, I would like to thank you very much for coming on the program. I would like to, to thank DJ for being on the program. I'd like to thank Diamond from Oppenheimer Ranch. Definitely subscribe to their YouTube channels. And also, I want to thank Brady Shally. Because Brady Shally has painted all of this artwork for me you're looking at right here. And she has just really made it a lot more exciting to do these podcasts. Now, I'm just going to walk you around for a minute and kind of show you some of the stuff that she's done. She just did this for me here. And then also, I said, hey, I want to be, I want to be in Tron. Can you, can you put me in there? So check this out, ladies and gentlemen. Would you just look at that? And then she gave me some hot cyborg chick, which is pretty cool. Uh, thank you for that, Brady. I appreciate that. And uh, my wife won't be very happy about it. It's, it's okay. It's just, a, it's just a pain. I'm just joking. It's really my, her. It's her in a costume. It's her in green. So this right here is, I want to thank Dylan Monroe. Dylan Monroe put this together. This is the original prototype of the Cult of Baal. This was uh, signed by Dylan also. And just so excited that I got this. I like ran over to him like, hey, man, come on. I, I didn't really give him much of a choice. So I want to thank you for that. <laughs> And uh, also, check this out. My friend sent me this one. Um, here, was it? There we go. Right there, you can see this. This is from France. My friend Gisby sent me this from France. Uh, these were made in Cancun. Those were actually airbrushed in Cancun. And then you can see here, we've got some more cool stuff. So there you go, folks. I just wanted to show off my art collection because it's exciting in here, and I'm still in my pajamas. There was no better customer at Disclosure Con for the vendors than Rex Bear. Yeah, I, I'm like, okay, I want that. Yeah, I want that. I want that. And every time somebody bought my hat, I was like, okay, I'm going to go buy something with that. And then somebody actually, uh, anyway, yeah, so it was, it was cool. I had a blast there. And uh, the people that I met were just amazing. So if you were, um, if you were at Disclosure Con and I met you, everybody that I met there was amazing. And I just want to say thank you so much. Um, yeah. Nothing but, but good energy. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll see you guys again. So thanks, everybody. Be excellent to each other and be the change. You want to see. Buenas noches. Nack, 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 nack.